namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang dhammang sankhang namassami You have all been meditating for quite a few days now. Some of you have been doing that for many years, some of you a few months. But I think for all of us it is recognizable how how easy how easy the mind identifies with experience, how easy the mind uh, takes hold of what's happening within the mind and labels that as me, labels that as my, my story, my, myself, my life, this is what I really am. This, this experience is um, tenacious, it seems to come natural to us. It seems to be the process of the way our senses work, how, how the mind comes to know things outside itself, how the mind comes to interact with the world outside of the mind. A byproduct of that seems to be that sense that we, there is somebody in here receiving the information from a world outside, receiving uh, being touched by a world out there somewhere and uh, this seems to give us the sense there is somebody in there receiving all that, experiencing all that, thinking, feeling, touching, tasting, smelling all that. The The term with which, you know, which we modern people would probably most easily relate to that experience is, is identification. That's a psychological term. If we look how the Buddha relates to that experience, and he gives great importance to the study of that experience, he, he doesn't use the term identification. He uses other terms. He uses terms like, uh, like grasping, getting hold of, settling into... Uh, catching, believing, terms which generally don't refer to psychological processes, but terms which are uh, familiar to us from, from ways the body works, from ways our hand works. So one way we, we refer to that process of identifying with our experience, identifying with the contents of our minds, uh, one way to do so is to refer d- to this process in terms of the kanda, in terms of the five groups. We chant about them every morning. We chant about them that they are foremost the, the story of our pain, the story of our suffering. So, in our morning chanting, we identify squarely that suffering is grasping at any of these five groups of experience. I, uh, when Ajahn Chaya Sara asked me to talk, say something tonight, I uh, decided to speak about the Kanda. Some of you may remember Tamanera Panyavutta's quote on New Year's Eve about Anuradha, the monk who uh, is being pressed by wanderers of other sects about the nature of the Buddha, about the nature of the enlightened one. And uh, they make a fool of him. They, they, ask him. they ask him one of the questions which the Buddha refuses to answer. 
And uh, unlike the Buddha, Venerable Anuradha answers them and makes a fool of himself. So the monks of other sects uh, laugh at him and say, well, either this one is very green, you know, he's very new, or else he's an old, tattering fool and walk off. And then when Anuradha goes to the Buddha, and the Buddha presses on him why he could not be defined in the way Anuradha defined him, the Buddha. So in the example he gives is what Venerable Panyavutta read out, that the Tathagata is neither to be found within the groups of grasping nor without, that he is neither individually in them nor in their uh, completeness, that he is neither the totality of all five, nor inside them, nor outside of them, nor neither. And he presses that home on Venerable Anuradha. And then at the end he says, uh, don't answer such questions anymore, Anuradha. If you ask, if asked what I teach, just tell them, I teach the arising and the cessation of suffering. This and only this I teach. So I, I was rummaging around for this um, passage because I like so many things I have kind of read somewhere and wanted to know the rest of it, but I couldn't find it. So while we were diligently meditating and I was lying in bed, contemplating the, the buzz in my head, which didn't come from meditation but from fever, uh, I, at a more lucid moment I grabbed hold of uh, one of the Tipitaka books and looked up and I, I'm trying to find Venerable Anuradha and his... Uh, Adventures, I found another venerable who is very close to my heart and whose story I'd like to tell you tonight. Um, his name is, his name is Kemakam. He occurs in the same beautiful book of the Samyutta Nikaya, for those of you who are inclined to read such things up. Uh, venerable Kemakam was very much beset by this problem of identifying with experience. Maybe, maybe it, is, it is good to say something about these khandhas before we go into Venerable Kemaka. Um, like so many of the Buddha's teachings, you know, you can catch them superficially and they are quite meaningful. They make sense at the, at the first glance. You have uh, a fairly difficult uh, and apparently coherent sense of uh, I am experiencing something. Something is happening to me and at, at the end of the day you end up with the sense I am. This is happening to me. It's not just uh, this is happening but you have the definite sense this is happening to me. And the Buddha was very aware of that and if you meditate a little you notice how quickly the mind latches on to uh, contents of mind. How he latches on to thoughts, onto feelings onto associations, memories, physical sensations. How the mind latches onto these things and immediately takes hold of them, immediately, uh, what's the word, takes them in, makes them, declares itself as the possessor of these things, declares itself as being the owner, uh, acquires a sense of ownership immediately of, of the things which happen to us. You know, this it's, while we can quite happily say it rains and refer to the fact that raindrops are falling from the sky and we are witnessing that, that we are even feeling that, it seems very difficult to say it thinks. You know, immediately we say, I think, or you think, or he thought. If you look closely, it would be much more accurate to say it thinks than it, as you say, it rains. Because... Uh, the ability to control our thought is very limited. We cannot really say where thoughts come from. We cannot really say where they go to. We, uh, with great effort and discipline, we can order thoughts, we can say. Uh, okay, we play a game now. Only logical thoughts are allowed. So we play the game of logic. And now I say, this is a logical thought. This is a non-logical thought. I say, this is a true thought. This is a false thought, and so forth or this is a realistic thought, or this is an unrealistic thought. But all these are games. We cannot really control them in the way they arise. What we can do, we can say, evaluate them, or say, useful, not useful, bad. We can judge them. We can say, this is important or not. But the actual 
truth is that where these things come from and where these things go is outside of our control most of the time. So it would be much more accurate to say it thinks than it I think. The Buddha, to help us disentangle this experience, this density of experience with which we so easily identify, devised various tools. Some of these tools, like the, the teaching on the five khandha, in fact is not from the Buddha. You know, the teaching on the five khandhas is older than, than the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha simply thought it was useful, and redefined some of its terms, and uh, made very good use of it. In fact, it is one of the most uh, trenchant, one of the most uh, thorough of his conceptual tools in helping us to come to grips with our experience, with the mass of our experience, with the whole tangle of our experience. So he said, whatever you experience happens in, in five categories. These categories are nominal categories. They are not absolute categories. But these, it is possible to say of experience that it is never outside of either form, of feeling, of perception, of mental formation, and of sense consciousness. All your experience, internally in your mind, externally through your sense doors, happens in either of these five categories. Now, if you look to how this is, how this is understood, it seems easy enough, isn't it? You kind of, you have a sort of a sense of something happening and then you look, ah, here it, here it, here it moves, there it twitches, this must be a feeling. Ah, this is a thought, got hold of it. Now we got a physical sensation, this must be something with the body. This whole thing gives rise to some sort of mood. Here we have a sankara, and then you connect all these things with the actual way the understanding work, you know, the, the mind sense work. There you need consciousness. So you have them all together. It seems plain enough. But the truth is, their interrelationship is complex. While it is true at the superficial level, there is also much more to it if you look closely. The five khandhas don't exist independently of each other. You cannot analyze them cleanly, you know, in sort of laboratory conditions. I'm not I'm only going to study Rupa now. This only works on paper. It doesn't work in truth. You cannot work with any of these five khandhas on its own. The classic image of the the way they relate to each other and how they how they apply to our experience is something is the, the idea of a fruit. So, the color of a fruit would be a kanda. Its shape would be another kanda. Its texture would be a kanda. Its scent. The consistency of its flesh. All these would be different kandas. And it is very obvious, it is immediately obvious that it doesn't make sense to refer to a fruit uh, without speaking of all five of these khandhas. It doesn't make sense to speak just of the scent of an apple if you want to refer to the whole apple. So when we learn to disentangle our experience by studying the interrelationship of aspects of our experience, by dissolving our experience into khandha, by studying feeling or perception, emotion, intention, consciousness, uh, please make sure that you do not uh, make these things abstract entities. These are all facets of one and the same thing. You know, if your experience is the apple, then it is possible to say something about the scent or the texture or the flesh or the color. But this is only an aspect of it. You cannot really take the flavor away from the flesh or the shape away from the form. This does not make sense. This is only uh, an exercise. This is not an absolute distinction.
when we chant the, the five focuses of the grasping mind are suffering in the morning chanting then the, the Pali for that is <coughs> Panchupadana Kanda and uh, just to tell you frankly I've never been very happy with that translation the five focuses of the grasping mind uh, gives the impression that there are five focuses of something which is intrinsically grasping that the mind is not intrinsically grasping it is possible for the mind not to grasp and it would be probably more true and a better a more reliable translation to say that, the f- that these five groups of existence are, are suffering if they are grasped at if and only if the, the bit which denotes suffering in the term Panchupadana Kanda is not the Pancha Kanda, is not the five groups, is not form or feeling, perception, formations or sense consciousness. It is the grasping bit, it is the Upadana bit. Upadana is the Pali for what we would call identification. Upadana is the, is the Buddha's way of referring to that process of identifying with experience. He calls that simply grasping, getting hold of, catching. It is not easy to say where this where this grasping or how it comes about. In the Buddhist teaching, the explanation seems fairly straightforward. Grasping comes because we want things, because we feel things, we want things, and then we act upon this desire. Thus comes grasping. Uh, There is a detailed analysis of that process and an analysis of the pain which ensues from that. This is another story. We I don't want to go into this today. You know, those of you who are inclined uh, have already taken this up already in some detail or can take it up at any time. We have <coughs> shelves full of books on these topics. Drawers full of tapes on these topics. It's the, the details of the second noble truth, the origin of suffering, uh, are very rewarding and unless we make ourselves very very familiar how we come to experience the things we experience how we come to feel the pain we feel and how you come how we come to avoid feeling that pain and create more pain in the process uh, that is a very important part of our lives and it's it's uh, one of the things contemplatives uh, are famous for doing have always been famous for doing I like to get back to these five groups of existence and what happened to Venerable Kemaka the Buddha referred to this way of identifying with these five groups on a variety of levels on a coarsest level he referred to it as basically holding up a theory that uh, we are either in these groups or outside of them or one of them and he kept during the whole 45 years of his uh, life uh, tirelessly refuting tirelessly probing his monks and said if you if you feel this way why do you feel this way if you believe this which bit of your experience it is that you identify with so he kept encouraging his monks to analyze to understand to dissect that sense of me you know, that kind of vague, amorphous sense of me which arises uh, out of our process of experiencing the world. I was speaking with Venable Chandako yesterday and <coughs> Tanke Marato, the former Tanke Marato, I'm sorry, I still haven't quite disrobed him in my mind. <laughs> he, uh, he still feels a bit like a monk. And we, we spoke about the nature of sense consciousness, how endemic, how endemic it is that uh, consciousness gives that feeling that uh, 
because something is happening out there, somebody must be in here receiving all that. And I compared that as if watching a sunset. You know, you stand somewhere, stand somewhere on the sun on on the south stands in England. That's a low range of hills, very much in the south of England. And you watch the sunset. The sun sets over the channel, which is nearby, and it definitely feels as if the sun is going away, you know, as the sun is sinking into the water, and that you are standing there, very safe and secure, elevated above the plains, above the beaches, and you can't help feeling that this is the way it is, you know, that the sun goes down and you stand there, although you know very clearly the sun does not go down. It is the earth which turns, and as you stand on the earth, you turn away from the sun. That's what it is. But that's not how it looks, and that's not how it feels. It looks very much as if the sun is going down, you know, very quickly. The sun moves very fast. If you look at it like that, it does a whole round in 24 hours. So, however much you know this to be otherwise, it looks like if the sun is going down into the water and you stand still. And in the same way, if you have uh, sense consciousness operating, there is something in the mind which reaches out into a world and comes back and tells you something is out there. And you cannot make that go away, that feeling. That seems to be simply how it feels. That seems to be endemic in the nature of how sense consciousness operates. The Pali sums that up very beautifully. It's vi jnana, the prefix vi always, not always, but in this case denotes a separativeness. So it is, it is separative knowing. You come to know of something by separating, you know, by separating a subject and an object. This, this gap, this uh, crack runs through the whole history of Western philosophy and the whole history of Western religion, in fact you end up somehow with a crack in between you and God, in between you and nature, in between you and creation, in between good and evil and so forth. In, in the Buddhist teaching, this is, this is not there. The, the subject-object split is not there. The Buddha says that things, there are three things which are necessary for experience to happen. He says there is name, there is form and there is consciousness. You need something naming, something which is resistant, and something which goes in between them, travels in between them, and bears witness from one to the other. This is, this is the, the, the basic minimal formula. You see, in Buddhism you end up in threesomes. You end up with three roots of attachment. You know, it's greed, hatred and delusion. It's not just greed and hatred, or just greed and delusion, or hatred and delusion. The same way, the basic unit for experience to happen is name, is form, and is consciousness. But the split still happens in consciousness. In the way we experience things, we end up feeling there's somebody in here and somebody, something out there. Because there's something out there, therefore there must be somebody in here. But you notice this is not an experience of the same quality as the color red, or the, this is a thought experience. You know, it is inferred experience. It is cognized. It is not actually felt or tasted or touched. You don't smell the self or taste it or touch it. You infer it. It's inferential. It has to do with the way thinking operates. So while we touch the world, something uh, in our heads, presumably, goes in motion and postulates that there is somebody thinking, feeling, tasting, touching. Venerable Kemaka was a fairly advanced practitioner. He was an elderly monk. <coughs> All this happened. This happened in the kingdom of Ujjaini, in a place called Koshambi. And Venerable Kemaka was 
uh, a man of which we otherwise know little. I, I like this particular sutta because uh, it has practically no celebrities in it. The Buddha doesn't appear, and nor do any of the great uh, Mahateras turn up. Uh, we know that it happened at the Gosita Rama, a forest outside of Koshambi, and that Venerable Kemaka was uh, there with a few other elders. And Venerable Kemaka became sick, gravely sick and ill, and could not be with the other terrors. And uh, after a while of being absent, they sent a young monk over to him and went to ask, inquire after his health. They went to inquire whether he was bearing up, whether he was uh, experiencing improvement of his ailment or not. And uh, they sent this young monk. The young monk went there and asked politely and uh, inquired in the sense the elders have sent him to inquire of Kemaka. And Kemaka said, no, really, things are not really going well. You know, as far as I can see, my trouble are increasing. Things are getting worse. And I'm not sure they're going to hack it. So, Venable, the young monk went back to the others. And the others seem to have known this is not said, but the, somehow it feels to me that the other monks seem to have known about Venerable Kemaka, and he, they, they seem to know something which is not said there. Sometimes you have this in suttas, you, you have this kind of clear sense, something is not being said, but is clearly, uh, th- there is more to that. So the other monks sent the, the young monk again over, over to Kemaka and said, well, we're sorry to hear that, you know, we're sorry to hear that things are getting worse, but tell us, Kemaka, are you, are you identified with any, any of your khandas? Do you believe that there is a self in your body, or in your feelings, or in your perceptions, in your sankharas, in your mental formations, or in your sense consciousness? Do you believe any of this? Is there an atta, you know, an atta in there? You know, that's the atta of anatta, of not self. And. Um, when Kemaka said, no, no, I don't believe such a thing. Please go and tell him, I, you know, I don't believe such a thing at all. And then the, the young monk went back to the other terrors and told them. And they seemed to, in a strangely, yeah, almost cruel twist, uh, lay into the man and say, but if you, Kemaka, really don't believe into a self, then that means you must be an arahat, must you? mustn't you? Now tell us really, are you sure that you don't believe in a self, either in your body, in your feelings, in your perceptions, in your mental formations, or in your sense consciousness? Now if that is so, if you really believe that, then you must be an arahat, isn't it? So the young monk once again went over to Kemaka, and Kemaka was, was getting tired of this, because he wasn't feeling good, and these guys were obviously up to some, what he must have felt, mischief. So he said, um, it is indeed so that I don't believe that a self of mine is to be found in either in my khandhas or outside of my khandhas. Uh, and yet I am not an arahat. I tell you, I am sure I am not an arahat. I am very clear about this. So, Dasaka, the young monk again, <coughs> went with that message to the older monks, and the older monks puzzled over this. And they, they berated the young monk and said, Well, if he says that, then please go and ask him. Now, Kemaka, if this is true that you say that you don't believe in the self, in your khandhas, nor outside your khandhas, how come you're not an arahat? And then the young monk went again and uh, thought, uh, told what the elders who were sitting in the other part of the park uh, asked from Kemaka. And Kemaka replied to him, Look, although I don't believe in a self, either in my khandhas or outside of my khandhas, I still have the feeling I am. I still have that sense I am. And I cannot deny that I have this sense I am. But as soon as I am aware of having this sense, I also recognize 
that I don't believe this. So he made a distinction between what he knew and yet still what he felt. You know, there was still a sense of I am in there. And now if you look in the Buddhist teaching, how the Buddha refers to this identification, to different degrees of identification with self and with aspects of our experience, the first of these degrees is if you hold a, an out-and-out out doctrine of a self. Buddha called this the doctrine of self, the teaching of self. So if you say, if you're a, a devout Catholic, and you have a clear doctrine of a soul, which after death uh, will rise to paradise, or will rise to uh, a judgment, and then either go into hell, or into uh, purgatory, or if it is a, a nice soul, will go to paradise, will go to heaven. Uh, this is an example of an out-and-out out doctrine of self. At the time of the Buddha, such doctrines were uh, very popular. We know of several of those. The Buddhist, Buddhist monks were debating with other wanderers who held various such views at length about the nature of such a self. And uh, it, it clearly uh, was obsessing the minds of the people in the 6th century. Uh, such selves, what they did and where they could be found and how they could be pinned down and what could be said of them and where, what they subsisted on and so forth. We seem to be less obsessed with such selves nowadays. We have, we have uh, a few clear doctrines on, on them, but on the whole, I think the majority of us don't hold such views or have been brought up on such views of self. Anyway, in the Buddhist books, these teachings on self, on a soul doctrine, is the most obvious, the most rampant form of a, a belief in self, a teaching in self. This is what he calls an atupadana, grasping itself, atavada, following a doctrine of self. But that's not what happened to Venerable Kemaka. Venerable Kemaka was an anagami, he was a, a non-returner. That is not an ordinary man. This is a man of some considerable distinction. And I suspect this is also the reason why the other fellow monks were uh, laying into him so much, because they suspected that he would be able to uh, help them to, uh, although on the verge of, of his death, although very sick and gravely ill, the descriptions are such that usually people who are described in such a way die at the end of the sutta. Uh, despite that, his uh, relentless fellow monks pressed him to deliver the goods. That's how it looks to me. So when Abukemaka pointed out to them that although he had no such belief in self, that he had gone beyond personality view, which is something already as a, a man who enters the stream, the stage, much before he becomes a non-returner as he was, uh, that he had put down the fetter of personality view, that he had understood that he cannot identify a personal and uh, lasting self in any aspect of his experience, that still he had that pernicious sense, there is I, I am, somewhere in there. And he was very honest, and he told them, and they pressed him further and says, now tell us, which bit is it that you identify with? Is it the feelings, or is it the thoughts about the feelings, or is it, is it your sense consciousness, is it your perceptions? And Venerable Dasaka, the young monk, went back and forth and back and forth. And at some point, Venerable Kemaka was tired and says, enough of this, enough of this. Dasaka, give me my stick, give me my staff, and I'll go and tell them. So he took his staff, and although very weak, walked over and went to seek out his, his other elders, who uh, seemed to be in another part of the park, and uh, a whole sixty of them, in fact. So when he went over there, he told them, look, this is how it is. I, I shall, shall describe you what happens to me, that my, my sense of self, my conceit, is still occurring despite I am very clear that I do not hold to a self-view in any of the five khandhas. 
It is as if you have a flower. You have a, a lotus flower, a blue or a red or a white lotus. And you take that flower and you ask, where is the scent? Is it in the petals, or is it in the fiber, or is it in the color? And to all of this, the monk said, no, no, it's not in the scent, it's not in the petals, it's not in the fiber, and certainly not in the color. So came a further, and they said, where is it then? And they had to concede and said, well, you know, it's in the whole flower, you can't, you can't take this apart. You know, it's, a whole, it's the whole flower which, which gives off the scent. It's not not one aspect of it. And then Kemaka said, such it is with me, such it is with my sense of I am, although I don't believe in a self, I still, as if a prevailing sense, uh, my prevailing sense of I is as if the scent of a flower comes out. I know it is not in the petals, I know it is not in the fiber, I know it is not in the color of the flower, and yet still there is definitely scent. There is scent of a flower. I cannot deny that. So Kemaka described that his conceit, his asmimana, as his effector, which non-returners still have them, a very subtle form of identification, uh, happens to occur like this. You cannot put it down. You know, Straight analysis, as in the teaching of the five khandhas, dissecting experience into five different heaps of experience and say, you know, form, feeling, perception, sense consciousness and mental formation doesn't get at this. You know, this prevailing sense of self is too subtle to be debunked, dismantled by plain uh, analysis. And then Kemaka said, but look, I know what to do, although I am not freed, I am very clear what my task is, what my, what my effort is, and how I have to go about it. So I shall tell you another simile on how to pursue. If you have a stained cloth, and you give that cloth to a dobi, to a washerman, the washerman, if he's a good washerman, will clean that cloth properly. He'll use what washermen at those times used. They didn't use essence and fab wasn't, for some reason wasn't in vogue so <coughs> dobies of the Buddhist time used cow dung, they used ashes, lye and salty earth so the washerman will use these things will beat the cloth with any of these substances on a stone and will get it clean this is my state I am uh, freed from atupadana I am not believing in a self I don't believe in a personality. I don't identify any aspect of my uh, five groups of existence with any lasting self. Uh, and yet, like my sense of I, my subtle sense of I, in this cloth, after it comes back, beaten, dried and cleaned, there is a scent. And it is not a pleasant scent. It is the, pleasant, it is the scent of cow dung, or it is the scent of salty earth or the, or the scent of lye although it is clean it clearly has this scent in it and a good householder or his wife will know what to do they will put it into a scented chest of drawers where there is incense in it or a uh, nice smelling wood and if it lies in there for a while it will lose the scent of cow dung or lye or salty earth and after a while it will become fragrant. Now, how do we do that as monks? If dissecting our experience into five khandhas